Hello and welcome to our next 2020 Top 50 virtual tasting event. Uh, tonight we're going to dive into the wines of South Australia and McLaren Vale Grenache. Uh, for those of you uninitiated with Young Gun of Wine Awards, we're into our 14th year now and e each year we go on a search and showcase for Australia's best uh, emerging winemaking talent, be they young winemakers or young wine labels. And we've recently announced our top 50 winemakers for, tw for 2020. And tonight we're going to be looking at six of those winemakers, as well as a special, as well as some special guests, uh, Charlotte uh, Hardy from Charlotte Dalton Wines and Rob Mack from Aphelion. The format for tonight uh, would encourage you to po propose any questions to our winemakers that we have on this evening. And you can propose your questions uh, beneath the video stream here on our younggunofwine.com website. And also, too, would encourage you to participate by uh, posting some comments on Twitter using hashtag younggunofwine, well, sorry, rather, Y-G-O-W. We'll pick up those Twitter comments and, and look to include some of those in our stream this evening. So also on a note for this evening, sometimes winemakers and other people in the trade can be prone to using a bit of wine jargon and uh, if any words fly over your head this evening at our website we've got a glossary of terms uh, you can find those at younggunofwine.com slash wine speak uh, but we'll try and keep it real so let's uh, get on and do some geography and check out the map of south australia and see the re the proximity of the regions that we're looking at tonight and Looking at South Australia, which produces half of Australia's wine. Uh, the state has well over 20 wine regions, and today we're looking at three of those, starting with the Riverland. It's Australia's hot climate powerhouse of bulk wine production. The place is dotted with behemoth wineries making gargantuan levels of plonk. The wine game here is about pumping out the most affordable and consistent product possible. The Riverland name hasn't really been a priority when it comes to labelling wines from these parts. But there's some tiny new champions in the region emerging. They're redefining the identity of Riverland, led by the likes of Delinquente, and joined in this year's top 50 by Gatchwine. And onto Kangaroo Island, a place which is almost virgin territory for wine. KI, as the locals call it, benefits significantly from the cooling effects of sea breezes. The fruit here ripens more like the Adelaide Hills region than nearby McLaren Vale. In the top 50 this year is the Stoke, who have become an exciting ambassador of the region through their wine projects. And last but not least today, we're exploring McLaren Vale, a region on the edge of Adelaide and spilling onto some of this country's most beautiful beaches. McLaren Vale is blessed with seriously old grapevines and also has the highest number of certified organic and biodynamic vineyards of any Aussie region. In this year's top 50, we have Bondar, Peralium and Somos. And joining us along with those producers today, we have the 2018 Young Gun of Wine, Rob Mack of Aphelion. Ask any McLaren Vale winemaker today what their most emblematic grape variety is, and they'll tell you it's Grenache, which is odd because Shiraz is the most widely planted variety in the region. And we're going to unpack all of that and a lot more this evening. So stick around. And with that, I would like to introduce our first guest, Charlotte Hardy of uh, Charlotte Dalton Wine. Charlotte was a finalist in our awards back in uh, 2017 and joined our panel this year for the first time to help decide the uh, the top 50 winemakers for 2020. Good day, Charlotte. How are you? Rory, I'm really good. That was really educational, that intro. I learned a lot. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> good. Um, Tell us, what was it like helping decide the top 50 winemakers for 2020? That was awesome. So being, you know, I was a finalist in 2017, so on that side of the fence, um, I knew all that emotion. When you find out that you're a finalist, it's pretty special. It's pretty, it's really emotional, actually. So to be on the inside was so cool. And uh, I credit you because it's such a cool group of people. So it was a really nice uh taste and environment and it felt really safe like everyone spoke everyone talked about the wines there was no it, it was just it was just brilliant so 
You've been in a, in, uh, in South Australia for 13 years now. You've travelled the world making wine. You're a Kiwi by origin. You came to Australia via the USA. What is it about um, South Australia winemaking that's so compelling? It's like a whole little little countries in one state, I think. We've got so many regions and each of those regions has amazing attributes and challenges, which I think breeds quite interesting winemakers and interesting ways of going about things. You know, there's, there's some regions have issues with salinity and a lot of issues have, uh, regions have issues with water and heat and frost and cold. And so that really makes for some really interesting things going around. There's also a lot of history in South Australia. So it's old. And as you said, it's where a lot of the wines produce. So there's a lot of people to learn from. And we've also got cool people coming through. Like um, tonight, you've got Bondi, you've got Andre, and you've got um, Charlie. Really experienced winemakers now launching their own brands, which is it's just so exciting. There's so much bravery now. So I was really attracted to that. It's like a free, open place. There's a lot of creativity and innovation in the state. For instance, mm. Did you know that the goon bag was an innovation created in South Australia by Angove? Did not know that, but well, there you go. Completely you believe it. <laughs> I do. I do. I feel like I'm an lecturer at uni. <laughs> um, but seriously, between Adelaide City and, and the regions that it's circled uh, by, and the proximity of these fantastic places that we know and love, Barossa, McLaren Vale, Adelaide Hills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there's a tremendous amount of uh, collaboration that, uh, that that goes on, and looking at the, this year's top fifty, for instance, um, you've had had your own exciting uh, project with Delinquente with a pop up cellar door. Yeah, so that was really that was cool. That was last summer, and how important is that now? You know, these collaborations with all that's going on in the world. So go South Australia. So last summer, uh, Nick Dugmore, again, one of his little brainchilds, came up with the idea to have a mystery cellar door down here between McLaren Vale and the coast. Uh, and there were four producers in there. There was myself, Skew, Dallin Quinte, and the Stoke. And it was a mystery. So there were 12 wines. People came in and tasted 12 wines, and they didn't know what they were. And they sort of worked, tried to work it out from the tasting sheet. So it took away any sort of preconception, any snobbery. It was just a really nice way for people to come in and look at wine. And um, it was a huge success, and it gave me a really good insight into the Riverland. Actually, it was it was great. It was a great summer. Talking about Nick Dugmore of the Stoke, um, I mentioned that he's an ambassador. He's become you know, a somewhat of an ambassador of Kangaroo Island. He's he's roped you into a project called the Guru. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, he's incredible. So he's really putting a spotlight on the region. So he. Um, obviously has tremendous belief and, and is so excited and so passionate about KI. So he started this project called Guru and he enlists winemakers that he believes are good at a particular variety or have been awarded in a particular variety. So he chose me for Shiraz. And for three years, that winemaker makes wine off the island. So, um, and then he launches that wine and it, it just puts such a great spotlight. And also, it, it's a different way of making Kangaroo Island fruit, you know, just giving it to someone that's never worked with the fruit before. So you just, you look at it and you, you use your imagination and you perhaps do something different to what someone that's been making wine off the island for years and years and years does. So it's really good. It's a really good way to see what, what the place is made up of. Um, and t looking further at uh, some of the other top 50 winemakers this evening. What what wines do you have in front of you at, at the moment? Mm, got this little number. The Dallin Quente Pet Nat. So good. <laughs> That's, from, um, uh, from, from Con Greg, who we just Land. mentioned. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah we're, uh, uh, Greg's coming up next. We're looking forward to chatting with him. Oh, there you go. Uh, oh, I'm trying not to. I've, got to, mm. I've also got the, um, this little Nero from Gatch, also an advocate yeah. for Riverland. That's delicious. That's so, um, a lot of Narrows I find are quite a punch in the face of sort of pungency, yeah. but this is so restrained and so well, it's just beautiful. And then the Somos Cab Front, which is delicious as well. Well, you've got a, you've got a pretty handy collection there. Um, mm. And 
And I think it's I think it's a really interesting, diverse snapshot around the state. Two of those you've uh, just pulled up are from Riverland, but but those examples from the Riverland, they're really unusual unusual products. You've got a pet gnat there, uh, and then you've got this nouveau style Nero d'Avila, and uh, then uh, from from McLaren Vale, a, a, a Cabernet Franc, which I mean in Australia at the moment there might be forty Cab Francs made. So yeah. Yeah. that's uh, it's not many around about the place. How good is it to delve back into those older varieties like Cab Franc? I mean, not yeah. older varieties, yeah. but they were, you know, in the, the Bordeaux blends were so big and then they sort of dropped off and then people are bringing them back. I think it's, it's great. It's really exciting. Charlotte, mm. thanks so much for joining us. And Thank thanks you. so much for your help in uh, in in uh, in tasting through so many wines earlier this year to help de determine the top fifty winemakers for twenty twenty. So with that, let's get stuck into the wines uh, this evening. And first up, as uh, Charlotte just showed you, we've got the Delinquente Weeping John uh, Pink Pet Nat. I think I've just uh, slaughtered the pronunciation of that Weeping. Weeping Wan, I'm sure it's meant to be. Um, but uh, Pet Nat, for those of you who may not be aware, is a really lo-fi method of making sparkling wine. So conventional sparkling wine, like you see with champagne, they've made a proper wine. The wine's been in barrel or whatever form of vessel, and it's dry wine. And then what they do is they add yeast and sugar to it to create a secondary fermentation and they bottle that and a byproduct of fermentation when those sugars convert, out, uh, when the yeast convert sugars into alcohol, carbon dioxide, the CO2 is the byproduct of that, which is the lovely bubbles that we get in wine. So that's the conventional way. And the Petillant Naturel method uh, actually predates that and it's and it's much simpler but it's a little riskier because you've got to get your calculations right um, uh, they they bottle it before it's finished fermenting so it finishes its ferments in, in the bottle and the bubbles get trapped in the bottle from the primary ferment so after the grapes are picked after the grapes are harvested off the vines and the grapes start fermenting the sugars start converting to to alcohol before it's finished into bottle and there you go. But if you bottle it too soon, you get too much gas build up and then you can have hand grenades on your, on, on your hands, uh, exploding bottles. Let's get uh, Greg from Delinquente on to chat all about that. I'm fascinated to know, Greg, how many exploding bottles have you had in your time with, uh, with Pet Nats? Because you were you know, one of the early guys in Australia early winemakers in Australia onto the style? Uh, well, Rory, our, um, our calculations have been spot on from the start, so we haven't had any exploding <laughs> bottles. But, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's uh, from a little bit of experience. Um, there was definitely some experiments back in the day uh, at home that, uh, that didn't work out so well, and there was uh, the glass and some pretty sticky juice going all over the place. So... We've definitely made that mistake before, but luckily not with anything that we've uh, put out to market. Um, so Riverland, let's have a chat about that because it's 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 really brave what you're what you're doing in some respects, getting out there and promoting a uh, regional group of wines from a region that that hasn't really had a name established for itself in the places that you sell your wines what's what's it what's it been like and getting out there and 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 telling or selling a, a riverland story yeah it's i mean initially absolutely it was it was pretty difficult um you know starting the business in 2013 2014 uh, when we went to market no one really knew what the riverland was or, or where it was uh, and if they did know, they had some pretty negative connotations um, with it. So, uh, you know, there was a little bit of um, little bit of uh, negative feedback initially. But uh, I'm from the Riverland; it's where I grew up. 
um, and it's a really special place for me. So uh, there was a lot of passion behind what I was doing and, um, and a real belief that, uh, that we could make really, really good wine from the Riffland if we grew the right varieties and, uh, and you know, concentrated on making wine that, um, that really spoke of the place, fresh, vibrant, youthful. Uh, and so we really put all our weight into that and, and over, you know, the preceding years, Brace the varieties that we work with, um, you know, varieties that they might not have not have heard of before, but you know, taste really good and are really well suited to not only our climate in the Riverland but also our um, lifestyle in, in Australia. So uh, it's been it's been a, a good journey, a, a difficult one at times, but you know, we're really you know reaping the rewards of some hard work initially. And chatting about this wine, uh, the Vermentino and Lagrain, it's it's a quite unusual blend. You've got the white grape Vermentino with the with the dark skin grape Lagrain. What what was the idea behind that one? Yeah, so I think with this pet nat, I've always from when we started the the twenty fifteen was the first time that we made a, a white pet nat, and so twenty sixteen I really wanted to introduce a, a, a pink sparkling into the range. Um, and the easiest way to do that, that maintained, you know, the, the Christmas and that, that lovely vibrancy and freshness was to have it based on, on a white variety um, that I thought was really well suited and, and blending in a little bit of red to give you that feel of, of you know, that red fruit and that lovely sort of um, tannin and that sort of spiciness, but without overdoing it and overplaying it in, in the finished wine. So, um Vermentino is always the base of the pink pet nat. Um, it's a really lovely variety that has a lot of very different fruit profiles as, as you work through it. Um, you know, we're looking at citrus. Uh, there's a lovely stone fruit, uh, almost towards sort of a nashi pear sort of uh, fruit profile in the mid palate. Um, and then you finish with that nice briny, salty, very uh, reminiscent of the ocean Vermentino profile. Um, and the red variety that we use is, changes year on year. Um, depending on what's available and, and you know what looks really good and what we think will work well. Um, Lagrain for the 2019 vintage happened to be there at the right time. Um, and the way that we'd picked it nice and early, um, and it was only on skins for you know less than a day, so just extracting that really tense colour but not too much of it, um, just sort of worked really well with the Vermentino, gave that nice red apple um, you know, touch of that sort of bright raspberry sort of feel uh, without impacting it with too much tannin and too much intensity and extraction. And you've been uh, making pet nats for quite a while now and each year you bring out multiple pet nats. So you've got a few under your belt. What's, what, what have you learned around making uh, pet nats? What's, what's the secret to making a good pet nat? Well, the, the secret um, was actually uh, passed to me by um, someone that I uh, look up to a lot, um, Brendan Keys from BK Wines. Uh, you know, his whole, I asked him before I made the first pet nut I ever made, I was in love with his pet nuts uh, that he made. And, and I said, Look, man, what's just, you got to tell me just one secret. What do you got? And he said, Just make sure that the wine is good. And if you think about it, um, that might seem like a, a, you know, a pretty broad, almost nonsensical statement, but the pet nut will work out and will turn out really, really well if the overall the wine is a beautiful wine. So if you pick it at the right time, you, you know, it's fruit from a, a vineyard that's healthy, that's vibrant, that's got life and energy, you know, farmed organically, um, you know, has that natural acidity to it, um, and you treat it really well, even if you make it as a pet nut, it's going to work out well. So, you know, that's that's been the sort of the basis. We haven't uh, screwed around with it too much. We're very serious when it comes to pet nut. That that wine has to be the best possible wine we can make. And, and that uh, that one rule has served us really well. Greg, thanks so much for your time. We're going to crack on now to our next wine, but we're going to grab you back in a few minutes for a bit of a Q&A. Uh, so no we'll see you soon. Thanks, Greg. So on to our next wine. We're again in the Riverland. This is, uh, this is an exciting new product, uh, project rather, uh, by a label called Gatch. 
and a winemaker, Ansel Ashby. And uh, this is the Nouveau Nero d'Avla. And we're going to get Ansel on the line and have a chat with him. Ansel's, as you'll see, has a bit of an accent. He's, uh, <laughs> he's from the USA originally and came to Australia via New Zealand. He, um, he was he was a wine he was a wine journalist I think, and somehow fell into or caught the wine making bug in New Zealand. And next thing you know, he's living in South Australia. How are you, Ansel? I'm doing very well. How are you, Rory? Great, thank you. So, so I, I find your Gatch label concept really interesting. You're just making three wines: a white, a rosé, and a red, and mm. The emphasis with 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 what you're doing is around drinkability, rather than some of the other stuff that we, for instance, right now are getting hung up talking about, such as regionality, etc. So when you're going to make one red wine and you want to make a drinkable red wine, what is it that takes you to Riverland to work with Nero Devler? There's a couple of things. The, the first thing is anything that you're going to be able to sit down and smash has to be really refreshing. And it has to be refreshing if it's 40 degrees out and it has to be refreshing if it is 10 degrees out. Um, and there's a couple components that make a wine refreshing. So that's fresh fruit, that's vibrant acidity, um, and it's tannin but not having a lot of tannin, it's having tannin in an interesting way that brings that acidity and that fruit together. Um, and that's, I guess, I, I guess that's the idea, is um, making a wine that you don't have to think about, but if you wanna think about it, there's a lot going on, there's a lot there. Personally, I love nouveau style wines. You know, I love I love what you're talking about there in terms of drinkability. N nouveau style. When we when we talk about that word, it it's trans translated it from French. It, it essentially means new. They're wines that uh, are made. Uh, they're they're made from vintage and they're put into bottle quite quickly and they're delivered young and fresh and the, they're, they're designed or made rather to, to drink now, to enjoy now, uh, to be mm -hmm. smashable as, as you put it. Uh, so it's really interesting that in, in wanting to make that sort of style, it's like conventionally, it's typically when you think about the, the, nouveau, the nouveau word and, and the sort of varieties you might expect to make for a nouveau wine, you're thinking of, Gamay or Pinot Noir or Syrah, but you chose Nero Devla. What was what was your thinking there? Um, look, I, I'm going to go back to what Charlotte said earlier. A lot of Nero made in Australia is this big punch you in the face thing, and it doesn't have to be that. Um, one of the most appealing aspects of Nero to me is that sort of uh, herbal and spice character that you can get, but if you can pull back from the really weighty fruits and the high alcohol and the aggressive tannin that sometimes comes with Nero in Australia, especially Nero made in places where you're looking at high alcohol and things like that, um, you get something that has that brightness and that freshness and uh, that drinkability um, and is really approachable. Um, I, I mean, looking at the one we're looking at, it's only 12.5% alcohol, and that's coming from the Riverland. The acidity is bright. It's fresh. The fruit is fresh, but it has complexity. It has spice, which is intrinsic to Nero as a grape variety that um, maybe gets lost in a lot of Australian Nero. Yeah, I, I, I really love what, you, what you're doing, and I completely concur that the wine is super bright. There's the, there's you know this gorgeous array of of red berry fruits, but then there's this there's this savoury dimension to the wine too. It's got these earthy characteristics that that come with with that Nero Davila. Chat us chat us through uh, what what at, uh, the winemaking process for a nouveau style wine looks like. 
So traditionally, again, for those that aren't familiar with the style, it's made in um, Beaujolais. And Beaujolais Nouveau, the, the new Beaujolais is a very famous, but sort of not necessarily regarded wine. It was the young wine, the first wine that was made in any vintage. Um, so a lot of winemaking tricks were made to get the wine onto market, get it into bottle as quickly as possible. Um, I think some of those ideas are great. So this wine in particular, we use um, skin contact um, on the red, but a lot of stems. We use carbonic maceration, uh, which I probably don't have enough time to go into right now. Um, but press off the wine relatively young. We put it into old barrels because we don't want new oak character that's just going to dominate the wine. Um, and we bottle it relatively young after about five, maybe six months because it preserves that freshness and that brightness and everything that's delicious about a wine like this without any of those heavier oxidative notes and those bigger tannins and, and you know, things that make a wine heavy and dense and not really drinkable. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that insight, Ansel. And um, we're, we're going to jump into the Q and A now with uh, with Greg from Delinquente. My own personal final remark on on this wine is that um, I think this is the style of red wine that would take a chill really well. So you could throw it in the fridge, pull it out on on a on a warm day, and, and enjoy a slightly slightly chilled red. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for. Thanks for uh, sticking around for some Q&A from the audience. And we've got some questions that have come through. First one for Ansel. What do you think uh, the future holds for Nero Devler in Australia? I think the sky's the limit right now. We, we really need to explore what it can be. Um, I think there are probably going to be some more serious wines coming out of places like McLaren Vale, possibly Barossa. Um, but I think it has a lot of potential as a really refreshing, young drinking wine um, that just hits all the pleasure notes. It's fresh, it's bright, it's fruity, it's just yum. And Greg, uh, how did you land on Weeping Wan as a name? Uh, all the labels were made by a buddy of mine, uh, Jason Cohen, uh, he goes by the name of Ankles, or used to. He sort of changes that up every now and again. But um, but he's a really awesome illustrator, and he created all the different characters for each of the labels. His characters, uh, he drew some big portraits of them, and, and that ended up becoming the labels. So he named each one. I don't know how he came up with it, uh, but how the different characters sort of lined up with uh, with each of the wines over the last you know, sort of six or seven years uh, that I'm working on these wines and developing the brand. It all worked out really well. And I think the weaving one was the last one to fall into place. Um, yeah, and it worked really well. Uh, Gregor, I've got another one for you here. Uh, have you made a Lagrange as a red table wine? No, and I'm not really into it in the Riverland. Um, I think that Lagrange is, is a northern Italian variety um, and uh, and really well suited to cooler climates. Uh, but in the Riverland, it was a bit more of an experiment for me and, and it didn't quite work on its own. Um, I used it to, to what I thought was a pretty good effect, not only in the, the pink pet nat that year, but also in a touch of it in the um, Montepulciano that we released and also in one of the hell wines, the, the hell red, which was Maro and Montepulciano and a little bit of that Lagrange. So, uh, it didn't quite work out on its own, um, but I liked what it added to, to blends and that's how we sort of used it that year. And Ansel, are you using whole bunch for the narrow Davila? Absolutely. So uh, this particular wine was about 50% whole bunch. Um, and then the crushed grapes going on top. So we tried not to break up the whole bunches, tried not to break the skins and then press off after five, maybe six days. Um, so that carbonic, carbonic whole bunch idea is very important to this style of wine. 
for every for anyone watching right, right now, if you want to if you want to look at a definition of what we mean by whole bunch, you can go to younggunnerwine.com slash wine speak and uh, and you'll find the answer there for you in our glossary of terms. Uh, Greg, what's the most a pet net uh, could command in dollars? Do you what's the ceiling for the price? I I think that. Uh... As I said before, with you know what makes a good pet net, it all comes down to the base wine, and I think that really commands, uh, you know, or determines where a pet net would sit. Uh, I suppose in in dollar terms, um, if you're looking at a, a pet net from the Riverland, we're able to make it at that price that we do, because the the price for the fruit is where it's at. Um, you know, we're getting much more yield. Uh, per acre in the Riverland than we do in, in cooler climate regions uh, or more premium regions. So a pet nap from the Adelaide Hills uh, will demand a higher price because in, in inevitably the, the base wine is a, a higher value to it. Um, and I think that there is, you know, there's, there's an idea there that it could be, uh, have a bit of a ceiling on it, that it's, you know, a lesser form of sparkling wine. And, and I understand that there's less processes to it. But if the quality of that base wine is there, um, then it can be as beautiful and as pristine as, um, you know, a, a first, first growth champagne. Um, you know, it just depends where it comes from. Greg, I've got another one for you. Uh, have you worked with Petit Vidot in the Riverland? No, uh, there is a bit of Petit Vidot in the Riverland. Um, it's not in our, uh, what I would call, ballpark with Italian varieties and specifically southern Italian varieties. Again, that Lagrain was a little bit of an outlier in that sense. Um, Petit Vidot is similar to Lagrain in that you know, it's got heaps of colour, uh, you know, really strong tannin profile, um, you know, that inky sort of feel to it. Uh, so, you know, a no, but uh, there is a lot of Petit Vidot in the Riverland, you know, considering uh, the nature of the place. Um, Ansel, I'll direct this one to you. Would you say, first, would you say the Riverland is uh, the best place for Italian varieties in South Australia? Look, to be honest, I think it's a bit early to make a call like that. We're, we're really experimenting. Um, and Italian varieties. Are you talking about Nebbiolo up in the north? Are you talking about Corvina? Are you talking about Norello Mascalese? It's it's way way too early. Um, I think there are some varieties. Nero d'Avola is a really good example that are going to work incredibly well in the Riverland. Um, but I think there are other varieties that are going to probably work better elsewhere. Uh, Greg, do you have do you have anything to add to that uh, question? I think that uh, I think Ansel's hit on the head. You know, Italy is uh, the most number of native varieties uh, than any other country in the world. Uh, so yeah, and it's a very long and thin country that goes over you know many different uh, latitudes. So the doggo has just got involved, which is good to see. Yeah, I wonder what sorry. he thinks of it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he loves um, it. He so loves he, it. He's a bit thinky, yeah, but exactly. yeah. he's a, he's a, love the camera. Next, so. <laughs> um, all right, next one. Is there any frappato around the Riverland region? If so, ha have you tried it out, Greg? Frappato? No, there, no, there isn't. Um, uh, there is a very, very long process. Um, you know, our uh, our quarantine. Um, procedures in Australia are very, very uh, stringent. So it is a it is a long process to import um, grape cuttings and get a new variety into the country. Uh, Nera d'Avola and Montepulciano was um, you know was introduced a long time ago now. In, in you know, relatively speaking, so yeah, we don't have frappato that I'm aware of in Australia. Um, thanks, Greg. I'm just cheersing uh, Ansel over our oh, virtual cool. space there. <laughs> Ansel, how are we picking to achieve freshness? Sorry, I say that again. It didn't. How are we picking to achieve freshness? That, that's a really difficult question. Um, acidity is a really important thing to look at more than alcohol. Um, 
And I think, to be honest, it has a lot more to do with my grower than it does to do with alcohol or anything else. Um, it, I can't emphasize this enough, enough. The grower has the biggest impact on the quality of grapes. Um, so this was picked at 12 and a half percent is what the eventual wine came out at. And um, it was one of the last picks in the Riverland when we made this wine. Um, but the acidity held, and that's something about Nero de Avila, is the acidity held and the brightness and the freshness of the fruit held. Um, so for me, it's going out there and I, I literally, in the middle of vintage, I rent a truck and I drive out to the Riverland and I go taste a bunch of grapes and I go, not, it's not ready yet, not, it's not quite ready yet. And when it, I go, yep, let's pick it. Um, but that's me tasting the grapes and looking at the acidity and looking at what it's like and making a decision based on that. Um, that's a bad answer to the question, but it's kind of an honest answer. And uh, Greg, what regions in the Riverland are you using fruit from? What regions in the Riverland? What uh, regions the Riverland. in the Riverland? Yeah, I mean, I actually got asked this question yesterday about, um, you know, sub regions of the river whether that was a relevant topic or a relevant uh, issue to, to pursue it's a difficult one because it's a flat uh, broad region um, all of our fruit is sourced from from two vineyards predominantly from the Basham family vineyard uh, in Barmer um, which is a certified organic and biodynamic vineyard uh, that's where I would say about 80% of our fruit comes from. The, the balance uh, is a Bianca della Sano, which we source from the Proud family in Loxton. Um, so when we talk about different regions within the Riverland, um, it is a very large region. It's very long. Um, if you could recall the map from before, it pretty much runs from the top of the Clare Valley almost down to the bottom of McLaren Vale in you know, the same distance. Uh, but uh, it is less of, um, less of a, a region that differentiates as you move along it it is quite flat it is fairly similar um, all the way across it so a, a sub-region argument in the riverland has some pitfalls but like i said uh the the area in barmer where we source most of our fruit from and where the basham family vineyard is uh is a, a beautiful part of the riverland and really beautiful soils a bit of limestone underneath um you know really vibrant part of the the region so I'm love very happy to be sourcing fruit from there Right. And I'll, I'll just agree with that. All the fruit I source is from the Barmara and it's beautiful fruit. Well, there you go. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Greg, it's your wife's birthday. What are you doing here? Get her out of here. Take her to Go dinner on. or make her dinner. <laughs> well, it, my job would be a lot easier if I could just take her to dinner, but I have to go into the kitchen and cook it now. So uh, wish me luck, everyone, please. And hopefully we'll have our restaurants open again soon. Absolutely. All right, see you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rory. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So from the warm, sandy climbs of the Riverland to the beachy, cool sea breezes of Kangaroo Island, we're going to look at uh, the Stoke wines now and their wines. French for Shiraz 2019. I love, I love the name French for Shiraz. It's so cute. Um, Syrah is the original, original name for, for what we call Shiraz in Australia and importing the variety here and making wine. We decided to ockify it and call it Shiraz. So this is Syrah made in the French mould and Syrah is French for Shiraz. Let's bring on the maker, Nick Dugmore. Nick from the Stoke, the, um, the unofficial ambassador yeah. of Kangaroo Island. How are you? <laughs> yeah, not bad. How are you? I'm, I'm good, thank you. No, Sadly, like uh, bushfires ravaged. Well, mate, you never look underdressed. It's okay. You're looking terrific. I love your branded T-shirt. You've got the Stoke branded yeah. T-shirt on. A bit of product placement. I tell you what, I'll put one of those on if you can get it in the mail. 
All right, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so sadly, Kangaroo Island was hit by bushfire early, early this year. How's, how's KI going? Um, I think it's all been sort of overshadowed a little bit now by COVID, but because there's still, you know, there's a burst of support, which has been incredible, but there's also, there's a lot of work for a lot of people to do still. Uh, the guys who lost their vineyards, they've got a huge amount of work to do. And then all the farmers out west, they're just, one of our friends, they lost 5,000 out of their 8,000 sheep. And uh, if you don't have any fences, then you can't keep your sheep in. So they've been, they've had about 80 kilometers of fencing to do. So they're pretty much going flat out with that. But um, the guys in the vineyards, I'm, I actually I haven't spoken to the guys at the Islander Estate. I'm not sure what their plan is um, going forward, but I hope that they bring their fruit back because it's amazing stuff. Um. So chatting about this wine, Shiraz and Syrah, it's in interesting nomenclature uh, and it brings up the topic of the differences in wine styles between a French Syrah and an Australian Shiraz. What are you trying to do with this wine? Yeah, that's right. I'm trying to um, make wines in a style that I believe suit Kangaroo Island. And a lot of the producers, um, oh, they leave their fruit hanging out a fair bit longer um, and it's getting a lot riper and they use, they work the caps pretty hard and they use a lot of new oak and things. And I believe the region needs to be making wines that are picked a little bit earlier, made in a more, um, uh, more modern style with some whole bunch um, and, it, we, we wanted to name this wine so that we could reflect what style I think the island can be producing because it's cool climate Mediterranean it ripens on par with the Adelaide Hills but it's been made in a different style so but like you said before the uh, it's in its infant stages Kangaroo Island so yeah it's it's quite good it's a blank canvas for us to experiment with and encourage other people to do the same thing this is a really gorgeous wine that you've made. It's uh, it's 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 medium bodied, but it's but it's on, it's it's on the it's on that lighter side of 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 medium bodied, and you can you can see those whole bunch uh, those those spicy characters coming through in in the wine, presumably from from the stalks and 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 some carbonic characters and. Again, if, you, if you're watching and, and those terms fly over your head, check out younggunofwine.com slash winespeak. You'll find a glossary of terms there. Tell us, tell us how, you, how you made this wine, Nick. Yeah, it's picked quite early. It's at 12 and a half Bome, and um, we ferment it in two separate portions. This was 50-50, but 50% 50 of it was 100% whole bunch. And we uh, start a little ferment in the bottom of the tank, pile all the whole bunch on top of that, and then lock it down. Um, and the other portion of it is 100% crushed. But we work the skins on that one quite hard initially. But when the alcohol level increases, we back up. Uh, seeds in the story. Um, and then we. Partway through, we start siphoning off the juice off the crush portion and we pour it over the whole bunch just to keep that fresh um, and uh, keep it moist and keep it protected. So it also helps to concentrate the crush portion of the Shiraz as well. So we're getting the, that's where the medium body comes from. You've, you're extracting quite a bit of phenolics from the skins in the crush portion and you're helping to protect the carbonic maceration as that ticks through as well. Well, it's certainly spicy and it's bright and it's slurpable and it's gorgeous. Nick, stick around. We're going to move on to the next one and then we'll get you back for some Q&A. Uh, for our next wine, we're uh, jumping across the uh, small ditch between Kangaroo Island and the mainland and landing on McLaren Vale's beaches where we find Somos, who have made a Cabernet Franc. And we've got uh, Benjamin and Maurizio from Somos. 
who are going to jump on the line and, and have a chat with us. Uh, gents, are you there? Whilst we're getting those boys on, there it is. That's the one we're talking about. Hey! <laughs> there we are. Lovely. Um, last year for our website, we did a deep dive into Cabernet Franc, and you can uh, find that on, on our website if you search for Australia's Best Cabernet Franc. Uh, this wine looked fantastic on that day when we did a blind lineup of every Cabernet Franc we could find in Australia, which was almost 40 Cabernet Francs. Gents. It also uh, looked fantastic today, Rory. Oh, well, it looks fantastic right now. I've got it in my glass. Uh, gents. What do you love about making Cab Franc? Well, what isn't there to love, Rory? I mean, it's delicious. Let's start with that. But, but um, yeah, it's just a variety we've both been uh, really uh, excited about for, for, for a while now. Even though when we were um, at uni a few years ago, it was uh, one of those varieties where, you know, the purists hated it. And we, uh, we were the ultimate hipsters. We liked it before nobody else did. <laughs> Except for those who are, but they're French. They don't count. Uh, so, so when was the first Cab Franc that you made and, and what was going through your mind when you, de when you decided or got the idea to go and make a Cab Franc? We first made uh, Cabernet Franc in 2015 and it was the very first Somos wine proper that we'd, we'd ever made. So around the year before with something else, but in 2015, you know, I was down in Arambal, working winery, winery down there, and we were able to find some Cabernet Franc, and we were able to find another variety, Alianico, and we thought, well, why don't we make these alternative varieties and make something interesting and fun and fresh and light and, and focus on alternatives, you know? And about, uh, tell us about the making of this wine, because it's a really interesting wine. When you look at it, tremendously aromatic, it's leafy, it's peppery, it's got these gorgeous forest berries thing going on. There's herd that's notes. That's the foot treading. Yeah, that's all Ben's <laughs> feet. Yeah, I think that's the main thing I would say there. Um, but other than Ben's feet, my hands. Now, um, so what we do with this stuff is um, we all, 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 we've always felt that cat from Scott, this thing, if you pick it too early, it's just you know it's it's like it's like vegetal to 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 a degree that it doesn't have that sort of um generosity of fruit but if you pick it too late then it is of its pretty so um, we like to to try to pick um pick it at two different times and so we'll do an early pick that um so it'll come like a 12 12 and a half bome um we'll press it early will be like a really pretty light floral component and then we'll do a second pick um depending on the vintage you know a week to 15 and that will really um showcase our fruit generosity we'll age them separately and then we'll blend them before bottling and then you that's where you get you know ben's feet from, no so uh, uh yeah you uh, get that real prettiness with that with all the fruit, really. Gentlemen, uh, thank, thank you so much. For, let's jump into our Q&A now with our audience and uh, we'll get Nick back on the line and fill some questions out there. And uh, first uh, first question, Nick, um, what's, uh, what's, what holds What's what's in the future for you with uh, with regards to vineyards and uh, Kangaroo Island? Um, we've actually just started leasing a twelve acre block over there, and we have all the vineyard gear to start running it. And it's got all the varieties that we, or some of the varieties that we produce, we'll still be buying from some other growers. But we've we've now got some skin in the game, which is really exciting, and we can do everything from vineyard to bottle and uh, we, we actually live in Wollonga on, on the mainland and be able to do some trips over there and really get to know the place a lot better than what we do. I mean, I know it reasonably well already because I've lived there back and forth for a long time, but it'll be uh, good to just get in and get to really understand the growing conditions and the different, it, it very, it's a very island and it varies a lot. So it's pretty exciting to be a part of it. 
Maurizio and Ben, uh, were you affected by the bushfires in 2020? Uh, not, not really. Uh, McLaren Vale was pretty much spared any of that drama. Um, thankfully, McLaren Vale. We did make a couple of little parcels of fruit from the Adelaide Hills just for a little bit of fun that unfortunately were smoke tainted. But uh, yeah, McLaren Vale was quite fortunate, I think, uh, large as a region in 2020. Um, Nick, any new varieties been experimented with in Kangaroo Island? Um, not really. We made a Cab Franc in 2018 and we've, we've got, or we've only got 180 litres of it, but we, I found uh, three rows in this vineyard that we've just got ourselves, um, that I didn't know existed. It got blended away into a Cab Sav, but I begged the grower that uh, if we could have it. Um, and there's actually some Roussan in that vineyard as well, and some so I think we're going to get into that next year to see what happens there. But with our with the project Guru, we're going to start giving varieties to these guys and see what they can do well. Uh, Maurizio and Ben, do you see more ripe style of Cab Franc from McLaren Vale compared to the Loire in France? Uh, in general, I would say yes, but that's one of the reasons we do the two picks that Mauricio mentioned. So we do pick it early to get that Loire style and we pick it quite green and get that leafiness. And then we pick that second component to bring the generosity of McLaren Vale. So I think you get the sort of best of both worlds in the way we make it. Um, and you get that sort of nice varietal leafy Cabernet Francness, but you get the nice slurpy, juicy richness of McLaren Vale as well. As a rule, I would say yes, though. I would say that, you know, Caramel is a lot more than Noir, that in general would be a riper style. I think the key is to try to get the prettiness that Cap Franc usually gets in the Loire, but but not lose the identity and the and the fruit intensity that Caramel can give you. Uh, this one's for you, Maurizio. Is that is this a Cabernet Franc? You can age at all. Uh, well, I, I would. I mean, we, we usually open um, every Friday for winery drinks and back vintages of a few things and a few other things. And maybe we drink a fair few things all together, I would say. But anyway, um, the, uh, I think that the wines look pretty, pretty cool after a while. Um, at, at, you know, at the end of the day, we make wines that are very well uh, and look great when they're really young. But um, but yeah, if you lay them down, I wouldn't lay them down for 20 years or anything like that. I'd lay them down for five uh, years, maybe, maybe a bit less than that. But yeah, I think they'll age pretty well. What do you reckon? I don't, why is this question for me? That's the real question. <laughs> um, do I look older Someone's than Ben? Is that, is that the thing here? Uh, well, actually, it, we did open very recently the 2015, which was the first vintage we made. And it's looking really good. It's still really fresh and vibrant. Um, and I think, yeah, Cabernet Franc and, and our Cabernet Franc, because that's what we're talking about, has the structure to age for that five, six, seven years as well. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Nick, uh, looking back at, uh, at, at some of your comments earlier, what does working the caps mean? Can you tell us about that, what we're doing in winemaking when we're working the caps? Uh, pretty much when a red wine ferments, no, nah, not that cap. <laughs> pretty much when a red wine ferments, the CO2 is lifting the skins to the surface and uh, and we call it the cap. It forms across the top uh, of your ferment and you're pushing it down. And the reason is so you can get um, skin contact with your wine or your juice so you can extract phenolics from the skins. Phenolics are, will, is what will be giving you a lot of... Um, Mouth in. It's why you see a lot more in red wine than you do in white wine. And Nick, uh, are you are you making the wine on the mainland or on K Kangaroo Island? Yeah, we have a winery down in Mount Jagged, so about twenty minutes from where I live, uh, with another producer, Skew Wines, and we've got it's pretty much just a big insulated shed where we we bring the fruit back and we do everything in there. So at Mount Jagged mainland. On the mainland, yep. And Nick, where does the no name the Stoke comes from? 
Where does that come from, the Stoke? Uh, a friend of mine, when I was 23, a friend of mine bought a farm, a uh, 2,000 acre farm that had 20 acres of vineyards in it. And he said, if I look after them, I can have them. Um, but they hadn't been looked after for seven years. And I gave it a crack. It la I lasted four years until a mob of sheep went in and ate everything that we had just blessed. <laughs> um, so I had to give up. It was costing us too much. I was on Stokes Road, just near Stokes Bay. And we called the we called the the company the Stoke. So I think you've got to have a little bit making wine from Kangaroo Island as well. There you go. Gentlemen, that's all that we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Maurizio, Ben, Nick. See you later. All right. Now, we're on Val Grenache. And a couple of years ago, we had a winner in the awards, our 2018 Young Gun of Wine, Rob Mack from Aphelion. And this is the latest release of his wines. It's the Confluence. Uh, Grenache, really interesting variety. It's thin skinned. It's uh, in warm, it loves the heat, loves warm conditions. It's prone to really ripen and it can get high sugar levels. Uh, but because of those thin skins, it gets a little color in the wines and a little bit of uh, tannin. And for all of that, People or winemakers often refer to it as warm climate Pinot, which is often what it just tastes like, Pinot, sometimes. And in McLaren Vale uh, recently, and I'm talking the last 10 or 15 years, it seems as though there's been a bit of a renaissance going on where in years gone by, the Grenache out of McLaren Vale was looking very confected in, in, in the glass, but, but uh, these days the, the wines have such elegance and finesse to them. And I'd love to chat to Rob Mack from Affiline about it, if we can get him on the line, because Mr. Mack here, he's a bit of a Grenache specialist. Indeed, he's a bit of a Grenache savant. <laughs> Rob, how are you doing? Yeah, good, Rory. Hope you're well, mate. I'm doing well, thank you. Great to see yeah. you. Um, yeah, look, great to see you too, as always. Um, yeah, look, Grenache is, is it's our thing, and it's what we built our built our whole uh, whole label on, to be honest. And, and we dabble with other things, but but Grenache is always it's always what we come back to, and what uh, what got us started, and, and what we focus on. And and each year you're making up to four different Grenaches. Step us through that. Step us through what in making four different single varietal Grenaches each vintage. Yeah, sure. So it, it all comes down to vintage uh, and what what the conditions are. So it's it's usually between two and four, uh, two at a minimum, and, and we have done up to four. Then there's also usually one or two Grenache uh, blends as well. So you could you could argue we're up to six some years. Um, 2017 was a was a cracker for us so we, we did the full the full suite um and and the thing i love showing about grenache is is the versatility of it and and i, I hear i hear this a lot now so i don't want to talk about it too much because probably people have heard about it but um it is such a versatile variety that you can you can throw a lot of different things as long as it's uh sensitively done i suppose it is like you say um thin skin so it needs picking times have to be bang on um otherwise things can go south pretty quickly um but the amount of nuance that that this grape has especially in in climates like mclaren vale that suit it and and when you throw some vine age into there um we work with vineyards between 50 to 90 odd year old uh vineyards usually in the in the same hands as the, as the original uh family that planted them too um uh, bring those all together, and there's just so much you can do with this fruit. It's uh, it's, it's almost uh, too tempting to, to to make as many as we can every year. So uh, so each year you bring out uh, your range of uh, Grenaches. You give them different titles. This one we're looking at here is the Confluence. 
there's another one from recollection the verdant yeah so the verdant is one of the uh, 100 whole bunch grenaches that we do the confluence is our i guess you say flagship grenache our main grenache offering it has um the name the idea behind the name is to to bring in um the, the confluence of our our top grenache parcels um and uh, the verdant, there's one called the Aromat, which is 100% whole bun, uh, sorry, whole berry, which so just stems taken out, but but uh, grapes remain intact, which gives us a, a real uh, fruity aromatic lift. Uh, and another one called the NB Grenache, which is our uh, more approachable drink over the next couple of years, um, slightly lower price point, um, just really get stuck in and go hard kind of uh, Grenache, whereas the confluence is a bit more uh it's a bit more tighter it's it's more a bit more acid a bit more tannin um and just needs a bit, a bit longer to unfurl to really show its show its straps and what is it about mclaren Vale and grenache in your mind yeah well, look it's a as i was saying before you've got the vine age on on a lot of um on a lot of uh sub regions on the on the, in, in mclaren Vale, particularly blue at springs which is Hopefully, some some people listening have, have heard about that. It's um, right in the top corner of, of the Vale, so a bit cooler. Usually, gets picked one to two weeks later than than uh, than down on the flats, and it, it creates a, a very aromatic, light to medium body profile, which is what we we really seek. And a lot of the the Grenaches that are really getting the name for themselves are coming from uh, either entirely or or a good portion from this from this region as well. Um, we do have a, a bit of fruit that comes from from some some places down the flat, which gives us a bit more uh, a bit more grunt to some of these some of these wines as well. Um, but yeah, look, vine age along with with climate uh, and winemakers who are really focusing on Grenache as a variety, are treating it as a, a bit of a sort of second fiddle uh, variety now, which is which is great to see. And finally, before I before I let you go, we, we'll bring you back on for a Q and A, but. You won the Young Gun of Wine Award in 2018. The year before, you took out our Best New Act trophy. So you're still a very, very young label. What was it like winning the Young Gun of Wine in 2018? Yeah, well, 17 when we got the, the Best New Act was the first real accolade we, we've had, and it was fantastic. It really kicked things along, and then to take out the whole competition the next year, was it, it was, uh, yeah, very altering for our for our brand it it was great for the sales which is obviously extremely important for any any young ish sort of sort of brand i'd say more importantly it was the the confidence hit that we that we got from it that that um you know a, a very respected group of people thought that that our wine was or out of the two wines we submitted was 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 reflective of, of winning this competition so um that's you know, i'm still riding high on that on that confidence two years later and i i reckon probably most people People who win the same thing. Well, Rob, stick around. We're going to get you back on for a QA and a now, but uh, we're going to crack on with some with two other uh, Grenaches from and two other producers from McLaren Vale. The next wine we're looking at is the Bonda Reina Vineyard uh, Grenache, and uh, Reina Vineyard is Bonda's own vineyard owned and run by Andre Bonda. We can get Andre on the line. And the, g'day Andre, how are you? Good, Ray, how are you, mate? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Good. No so, your Reina Vineyard, it's in the Bluet Spring. Tell us about the Bluet Springs and how it differs from McLaren Vale. Or how it differs uh, from other, think, other areas within McLaren Bar. Sure. Um, well, I think Rob touched on it briefly before, but really it's in the northwestern part of McLaren Vale. So when you head north of the township of McLaren Vale, and I reckon it it's defined by the fact it's deep sandy soil and it's elevated. Whereas the rest of McLaren Vale, or a lot of McLaren Vale, is pretty much at sea level. And it's heavy soil, um, often clay on limestone or just heavy clay. Uh, so Blue Springs, I think, with this sandy soil, um, brings like a, as Rob mentioned, 
and a, a lovely fragrance to wine and a lightness of touch. So you've got your own vineyard, you're managing your vines for yourself. Tell us when it comes to farming grapes, is growing Grenache different to growing Shiraz? Uh, yep, yeah, it definitely is. Um, Shiraz, well, no, it's, uh, uh, it needs water often, um, especially in our region, uh, which is quite dry, has a, has a wet winter, but it's quite dry. Um, where Grand Ash, famously, especially in Blewett Springs, um, doesn't really need water. Uh, so there's that sense. But also the other thing about Grand Ash is um, to get good depth of flavour, tannin, good structure, good colour, um, you really need to get sunlight onto the bunches. So um, to do that, traditionally, um, they've been grown as bush mines. Um, and even when they're trellised, uh, they're often growing with, you know, uh, some technique, uh, leaf and um, opening up the canopy to get some sunlight onto the bunch to get some good colour and tannin and structure. Very really different growing um, philosophy. It's, uh, it's really interesting hearing you chat about how you, how you manage the vineyard and what you're doing with Grenache and that you try and promote as much sunlight as you can onto those grapes so that they can ripen flavour-wise early or they can ripen flavour-wise before, sh before those sugars uh, fully, fully, fully reach their, their potential levels. And so, you, you, so you're able to pip, pick these flavour ripe berries without perhaps ma maxing out on the sugar and, and therefore ending up with a high alcohol wine on your hands. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's 100% right. And that, uh, I think, when you taste this wine, um, that's the big thing about it. Like, I, I really want to pick the Grand Ash early. Uh, I want to catch the, the brightness, the purity. Uh, it's a variety that can be picked early, um, and when it's picked early, um, it has lovely red fruits, uh, herbs, pure flavours. Um, and, and you're right, leaving that, that canopy open and getting some sun on the bunch uh, uh, gives me that, that ripeness, that, that tartness and the flavour before the sugars go to the wine that you know, less than 14% alcohol and has beautiful flavour and ripe flavour. Andre, I really love this wine. It's, uh, it's full of uh, wild, wild raspberry notes. It's got this Amaro-like herbs thing going on and it's got immensely fine-grained tannins to it. And so there's some real structure there. It's a very elegant and, and, and pretty wine with, 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 with finesse, but... But uh, there's, but there's, but there's, uh, as, as I said, there's some structure with the with those fine tannins in, in the wine. It, it looks gorgeous. The, it, I understand it comes from the, your your making this wine from a very specific plot or patch of grapes or vines within the vineyard. Yep, that's right. So um, we have when we bought the Rainer Vineyard, it, it had one block of Grand Ash. Um, then we planted another two. But this particular block is uh, 1970 planted, so 50 years old this year. And it took us one or two vintage, vintages to work it out. But um, really for this one, we picked the lowest yielding part of it, which is it's all got to do with the way, because uh, it's dry grown most years. Some Sometimes we, we water it once or twice. But most years it's dry grown and it's about the way the water falls over it. So, um, and the particular section that we pick, um, hand pick selectively these vines from, uh, gets very little water all year. So it uh, looks really different to the rest of the block. It's um, tiny little bunches, tiny little berries. Um, and you can see it, it gets, even though it's still got that brightness, that prettiness from being in the sands of blue essentially, um, it has this beautiful concentration um, despite the fact it's light. 
Andre, thank you for joining us. We're going to jump on with Paralian now and look at and look at their uh, their wine. But we'll get you back in a minute uh, for a bit of Q and A with our audience. So our next wine is our final wine tonight. It's from a new label called Paralian Wines. It's a Grenache and Shiraz blend made by Charlie Seppel and Sky Salter. And we're going to get Charlie and Sky on the line and have a bit of a chat around it. Charlie and Sky, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Rory. Hey, guy, Rory. Well, thank you. We're almost there. I should say that, uh, that this wine, along with the uh, Bonda wine, were two wines that were being offered in some Langton's mixed pack. Langton's our Langton's uh, our fine wine retail partner. Had curated a series of mixed packs around the top fifty winemakers this year, and they had your wine and uh, Bonda's wine as uh, as as two wines offered from our McLaren Vale Grenache feature tonight. Uh, so the the Shiraz and Grenache blend. Tell us what does it mean to McLaren Vale. Um. Well, when we got the opportunity, I guess, to start our own little brand, um, we were sort of looking at what was the what was the heart, what was what were the drinks that we knew as McLaren Vale. Um, you know, what were we drinking when we were dragging hoses for our first vintage? What were we? What were our parents drinking in the '60s and '70s that were in these, you know, amazing two-liter glass wagon type things? Um, they were kind of the community wine or the everyday person's wine, and they were McLaren Vale Burgundy. And McLaren Vale Burgundy was Grenache and Shiraz. Um, it was the coming out from fortified winemaking, table winemaking, um, and Grenache back then was probably really heavily cropped and um, it was a good booster for Shiraz to make things go a little bit further. So that's back then. Uh, these days it's still... Um, it's still a pretty prominent uh, blend in McLaren Vale. I mean, the original blend from Derenberg is uh, Grenache Shiraz. I think the first uh, church block for Wirra Wirra was a Grenache Shiraz. Now it's called the original blend before Brian Crozer, thanks Brian, came along and changed it to a Cabernet or a Bordeaux blend as they are. But there's other people still, uh, Steve Panel's got a, a tribute to um, McLaren Vale called the Vale, which is a Grenache Shiraz as well. So, uh, yeah, we felt pretty motivated to um, to make a wine that was uh, in honour of, I think, some of the best wines, most drinkable wines that were coming out of the district and still are. Uh, I'll direct this question to you, Sky. What, what, when you're blending a wine such as this, what's your what's your approach? And what is each variety here adding to the blend? Yeah, so with the Grenache, you've obviously got those really bright, fragrant um, red fruits. Um, so that's got a really nice vibrancy and a really nice acidity. When you compare that to the Shiraz, which has obviously got a slightly higher pH, like less acid, um, a firmer tannin profile, they're, they're really quite complementary. So they work really nicely together. And, the silky tannins of the Grenache, the more robust tannins of the Shiraz sort of meld together and you get a wine that's really quite generous and plush. So we're, we're just basically trying to put together a wine that's got really bright fruits, um, generosity across the palate and a really nice balance. I think I think the topic of uh, Grenache in McLaren Vale is an immensely interesting one. As I had said earlier, it seemed as though ten or fifteen years ago, when you're looking at Grenache from McLaren Vale, it seemed as though all of the wines were terribly confected and very juby. And nowadays, they look quite different. What's what's been the changing viticulture over the over the years? How how has how have how have things been managed differently in the vineyards then then to now? Um, it's it's been a big move. It, it was I think it was probably a tough one for a tough pill for a lot of growers to swallow, um, and and I think in a few cases it still is just to get people to stop growing tons. Um, Grenache fifteen twenty years ago wasn't 
as popular by any stretch as what it is today. Uh, and back then, people were growing for tons. You know, you, you hear stories of um, sort of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, uh, tons per hectare, and though that that fruit then getting um, you know carbon fined and sold to another another business for a sparkling wine or something like that, like it it actually had really really low value. Um, people sort of switched on to it, uh, as you said, Rory, about 10, 10 15 years ago. Uh, and there's been a move for better, better sort of focus on, on bud numbers, um, pretty much no irrigation because most of the time Grenache can survive. I mean, the, the last few seasons in, that we've experienced in McLaren Vale, um, the varieties that have stood up uh, the best, and we've had some pretty extreme heat, have been varieties like Grenache and other Mediterranean things, um, Tariga, these new things like Mencia and um, Montepulciano, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, it's providing a pretty great base for, I think, what potentially we could be doing better. But, yeah, uh, 20 to 20, 25 buds. Um, Andre touched on getting light interception on the bunches. I agree, that's critical. Um, so a little bit of leaf plucking if you do have some denser canopies, depending on the structure of the bush or, or um, single wire trellis. Um, yeah, and just oh, more attention to detail. Um, you, know, you, you see the best vineyards in the world and the best vineyards in the world have got almost, you know, one person looking after, I don't know, a block, it might be a hundred vines, it might be a thousand vines, but every vine gets the attention that it deserves. So that sort of level is is what people are doing with Grenache uh, and the really, really top blocks that are left in the Vale that, you know, post the, the vine pool scheme, they're demanding huge attention and people are really coming into the district, um, you know, looking looking for this these vineyards now. <clears throat> Charlie, Sky, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to jump straight into a Q&A now and let's, uh, let's see what's uh, come through from, uh, from our audience. <laughs> um, here we go. Rob, first one's for you. Have you changed the way you make Grenache over the last few years? Uh, look, it's all it's all vintage dependent. So every year is its own little microcosm. But yeah, look, we've we started in fourteen, so we've we've only got a, a short a short track record. But um, progressively, we've we've been picking earlier. So we we it, it it it's a it's a bit of a double edged sword. So sometimes certain good flavors may not quite develop, but but the balance is that you that this freshness and this um beautiful life in the wine um and say more of red fruit rather than than darker fruit uh spectrum comes in so i'd say that's that's probably the main thing we've done we've um we in the winery side of things we're not doing anything terribly different it's all it's all old older french oak that we use bigger bigger format five six hundred liter barrels up to we've got a couple of two and a half thousand liter uh old food drays as well big casks um that are just magic for for Grenache. We leave things on full yeast leaves to get a bit of a um, a, a bit of uh, texture and complexity to the to these wines as well. Um, that's been sort of our focus from the start. So uh, probably only probably only the picking time, I think, would be the the thing we've pulled back a little bit. Charlie and Sky, what's behind the name Paralian? <laughs> you go. <laughs> Uh, it's actually an ancient Greek word meaning people who live by the sea. Um, our home is Port Wollonga. It's uh, somewhere that we really, really love being. It's a beautiful spot. And uh, the branding is actually representative of the um, iconic jetty pylons at Port Wollonga. So there's an old jetty ruin there. It's probably one of the most photographed sunset spots in the Vale. Um, well, there's an excuse to travel to the Vale right there. Oh. Andre, do you think the McLaren Vale subregions will get more singular attention in the future? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, Lewis Springs wines, as we talked about before, look very different 
two wines from the flats. Um, and there's a couple of other really good pointers um, that can only help our region be bigger and better. I think uh, won't be famous for Grenache, but might be famous for other things. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, it'd be nice to get Blue at Springs as an official subregion. Rob, is Blue Springs the only subregion you're growing in? Uh, that's where we get, I'd say, probably 80% of our 80% of our fruit. Last year, we did start taking a little bit from uh, White's Valley, so down towards uh, the southern, sort of more coastal part of the of the Vale. Uh, and that's predominantly what goes into our uh, NB Grenache that I was talking about earlier, the one that's a bit more open knit and, and approachable. Uh, so all of our Blue Springs material that we that we produce goes into into the confluence and into our into our higher tier wines. Charlie and Sky, are you always aiming to blend, or does it depend on the vintage? Uh, it is one hundred percent vintage dependent. Um, we started out in two thousand and eighteen with two sites. Um, and in hindsight, perhaps we should have gone a little bit heavier in single vineyard um, production, but we didn't, because we believed, uh, you know, we believed in this blend, um, you know, it being sort of like the DNA makeup of what McLaren Vale dry red is. Um, so 2019 came along and we were 25% down uh, as a district on what was 2018, uh, and given our our tonnages, um, we have not made a blend in 2019. So, yes, it is vintage dependent. Will we make one in 2020? Um, it's too early to say. Andre, have you tasted of wines from the Rainer Vineyard? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I have. Um, Shiraz, uh, uh, broken wood, um, famously made some Shiraz from my vineyard. Um, uh, and yeah, they're, they're, they're um, very true to form, I suppose. They're, they're Shiraz generally, so, you know, full body, but they're, they're sand. Um, and gives you the lightness of touch and the fragrance, and, and that's what you see in these old wines. Rob, you said uh, do whole berry. You said you do whole berry without stems. How do you de-stem? Uh, yeah, so it's it's a pretty simple process. We uh, any hand-picked fruit can be tipped through a uh, basically called a crusher to stemmer. So all we need to do is take out the the part of the, the machine that, that crushes the fruit. Um, it's like a, a drum that spins around to. Um, the, the, the full berries drop through that into a, another little bin that we have underneath that then gets uh, tipped into a fermenter. Uh, and instead of dropping through that uh, and through some crushing rollers, it just drops straight through uh, and the stems get ejected out the, out the back. Andre, what new varieties should we be looking out for, looking out for going forward in McLaren Vale? Any new endeavours on the horizon for Bondar wines? Uh, yeah, quite a lot. Um, I think, uh, you know, the future for this region is, is probably not just Shiraz and Grenache and particularly not sure there's a potential to get warmer. Um, uh, we're looking at a lot of, um, you know, varieties that do well in, in warm conditions and dry conditions. So on our vineyard, we've planted, you know, some good Southern Rhone stuff, um, uh, and some good Portuguese stuff. So, Tariga, um, then Carignan, uh, Cinso, Ferrose. Um, yeah, there's a lot of Italian varieties too, uh, Nero. Um, you know, they, they just do better in, in warmer conditions than Shiraz and, and produce natural, have a natural acidity that's much more appropriate to making great wine um, that has natural balance. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a whole heap, you know. We uh, we're just the tip of the at the moment, but um, exciting. Um, and 
uh, the, I've already seen some great, uh, great results in the first and second years from those plantings. I've got a general question. I'll direct this to you, Charlie, first. Uh, what are the pros and cons of running your own vineyard compared to sourcing grapes from other vines or other vineyards? <laughs> um, well, we don't own any of our any of our own vineyards, Rory. Um, and I, a lot of my mates say, "Would you ever buy a vineyard?" And I and I do turn around and say, "There's better ways to burn cash." Sorry, Andre. Um, <laughs> Sorry, mate. Uh, we, yeah, I, I think we're probably not willing to have that stress or risk just yet, um, being so so new. Um, but we do, yeah. We work pretty closely with our growers. Uh, one one of them, set of brothers who we trust really deeply. Um, we can talk to them about X, Y, and Z, and they, they kind of go, yeah, that's that's cool. Um, they know what we mean. They'll do practically exactly what's sort of required, that sort of thing. Um, and there's no, there's no sort of, you know, I don't think there's any piss taking as such. Um, one of our other growers, um, they have their vineyard managed by them and we know the guy who looks after that block as well. So it's, um, it's a pretty small place for McLaren Vale and during vintage, during, especially during day job vintage, I can get around the Vale pretty quickly and see a lot of different vineyards and see what's going on and what's not going on. So it's only a little phone call or you, you drive past and you'll see someone who's uh, involved with what we're doing. And um, yeah, there's a little update every now and then. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, for us, it's, it's, it's actually pretty relaxed. Um, which is uh, <laughs> Andre, it's nice. Andre, and, give us the flip. Yeah. Andre, give us the flip side to that. You've um, you've 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 invested in a, in a vineyard a, a few years ago. What's the pros and cons on the other side of the fence? Uh, guarantee of supply is nice, <laughs> uh, but I think um, for me it's like like a lifetime of work ahead of me to um to get the best out of what i've got um you know like i work with growers i've always worked with growers but if it's yours then you know you can do the stupid shit you can uh you know you can drop 75 percent of the fruit if you want to you can um yeah, do do stuff that people think's crazy um and and that and that to me is interesting and different and um and then the other benefit to me is that it's it's home and that's that's huge for us i think um you know it's our home and it, it gives you that extra level of pride um that you do the whole the whole thing so um, that we we do buy fruit and i've got some great growers and um that's also a really important part of our business. Uh, Charlie, we've got a question for you. Um, yes, uh, Charlie is related to the Sepult or Sepult's field, et cetera. Uh, do you want to give us uh, an explanation? Do you want to illuminate that one, Charlie? Yeah, sure. Is there any relation um, to the Sepult family name? Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm fifth generation. Um, my uncle and father were uh, on the board uh, when it was still family owned. Um, but yeah, growing up, I was quite young, so I didn't have a huge involvement with that brand, which is a is a treasury owned brand. Um, Seppel's Field, however, is a business uh, owned by a gentleman, or well, majority owned by a gentleman, Warren Randall, who also happens to be my direct employer in my day job. Um, so yeah, I've, I do have involvement with Sepples Field um, uh, really minimally uh, with some table wine production um, in support with the chief up there, Fiona Donald and um, Matt Pick. Um, but it's, yeah, that's a, been a lovely addition to uh, my day job working for um, Uncle Wazza and uh, his tribe of merry kids in, uh, in McLarenvale. 
Scott, I've got a question for you. What is your dream Roan variety to add to the Paralene lineup? Oh, that's a tough one. I feel like we're playing with my favourites already. Um, so to be, to be honest, I probably wouldn't add anything else. I know that's okay. a bit of a cop out. We, we sort of chose these varieties. We love them and, and that's what we wanted to work with. Shetland Sky, I've got a question di directed to you. Uh, what do you guys consider the Australian benchmark for Grenache wine or producer? Ooh. Um, what do you think? It was like a bit of a loaded one, that one. I can see Andre laughing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm asking that question. Uh, I don't know. I, I actually can't. I can't go past. There's a previous business I work for, um, and a person I work with currently. Um, so that would be uh, Jackson Family Wines, which is Yangara Estate, um, and Steve Panel. Um, I think there's two contrasting styles. The hill, the the High Sands Vineyard is um, this just immensely powerful block. Uh, it comes in black and dense after one day. Uh, its tannin profile is accentuated by really really low pHs, sort of pHs uh, that would typically be for aromatic white wine. So that really accentuate this block. But it was planted in 1946 by Bernie Smart and his family. Um, he's a legendary person of McLaren Vale and especially of that area around Blewett Springs and Clarendon. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then you've got Steve who's, who's making Grenache off single vineyard sites as well. Um, some pretty close to where Andre and Selena are, um, just down the road on 28 Road. And then he gets some fruit off uh, Bernie Smart's block up in Clarendon too. Um, and he's... His style is a little bit more medium bodied. It's a little bit more savory. You can see high spice aspects, um, but his big driver is tannin and it being a natural preservative and giving Grenache long life and, and drives through the palate. So um, I would say it's pretty tough to split those two. And I would add to that, if you're interested to see uh, some of the best performing McLaren Vale Grenaches, on our website, we did a blind tasting of McLaren Vale Grenache. If you jump on, you can search for the title, Searching for the Best Grenache in McLaren Vale. We did a blind tasting with, with a bunch of uh, experts and we had about 40 wines in the, in, from uh, 40 Grenache from McLaren Vale in the lineup. And you can see what were the more favorable wines on the day at our tasting there. Uh, next question. Charlene Sky again, what are the percentages of Grenache and Shiraz in the blend for the 2018 uh, so the Grenache moment, Shiraz? Yep, so it's 52% Grenache and 48% Shiraz, so nearly 50-50 on it. Andre, what was uh, your appeal to McLaren Vale Grenache over other areas? Mm, good question. Uh, you know, we, like I worked in the hills, Adelaide Hills, mostly when I was learning my craft and it, it became a decision about wine, but also about lifestyle. So um, it, McLaren Vale is just such a beautiful place to live and make wine and the wines are world class, there's no doubt. And I think Grenache in particular, um, and Grenache from Sand and Blewett Springs and um, uh, in conjunction with lifestyle really was the, the, the deciding factor about where we wanted to end up. I mean, Selena and I, my wife, who's also the other half of Bondi Wine, she's, um, uh, you know, we're both from around here anyway, but um, uh, in, in, term, in Adelaide anyway, but we... Yeah, just that combination of beautiful, um, medium-bodied, fragrant 
wine, but also a life near the beach in the in the sunshine is was perfect for us. Rob, last question is for you. Do your higher end wines come from particular vines or is it a more intensive winemaking process? Uh, probably more comes down to barrel selection, to be honest. So, so we have uh, certain plots of the vineyards that, of our growers that we, that we uh, take fruit from every year. So that doesn't change. Um, they are, as far as I'm concerned, sort of the pick of those, of those vineyards. But what it comes down to is, is each barrel can look so different um, eight, nine, ten months after after production. So yeah, usually it's it's barrel selection. Um, some might go to the top. Some might sort of have a character that doesn't fit or doesn't have the delicacy that we're looking for, or the aromaticity, or, or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, it's it's usually a, a barrel selection that that uh, that it comes down to. There you go. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, Sky, Charlie, Andre, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. That's it for you guys. And that's we're coming to the conclusion of our virtual tasting event tonight. Our next one is coming off on Friday. We're looking at the topics of uh, white, white grape varieties, some skin contact, some unusual varieties. That's all under the banner of New Shades of White. And we're also looking at wines of Victoria. Uh, if you're interested uh, to participate in these virtual events, there's still mixed packs available from, from Langton's. You can jump onto their website. Each week there's two wines from a mixed pack from Langton's featured in our uh, virtual tasting events. And we're encouraging you to vote on our People's Choice Award. You can decide. You will help us choose who wins the uh, People's Choice Trophy, which winemaker will be your number one? And by voting, you'll go in the draw to win a bunch of amazing prizes. One of those is Liebherr Wine Cellar, like this one. This happens to be a dual zone, Liebherr Wine Cellar. Liebherr are, are amazing. They make the best uh, wine cellars for your home. Um, and we also have a Jackalope Hotel Stay on the Mornington Peninsula available. We have, uh, with that Jackalope Hotel stay, it's the ultimate weekend. We'll arrange uh, personal uh, cellar tours and tastings with Mike Alwood of Ocean 8 and Rollo Crittenden of Crittenden Wines, the two, par two past Morning to Peninsula's two past Young Gun of Wine winners. And we've also got a year's worth of wine from our top 50 winemakers up for grab. So check out our website, vote on the people's choice, come along to our next event. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. Good night.